This is a really wild and wacky text, and I hope that by the time I'm done with it, we'll have a little more understanding. But let me begin by telling you that I think festivals are a compelling social reality. I once flew to Krakow, Poland with my friend for a theology conference, and if you know anything about traveling internationally, the thing to do is to go out into the sunlight and get on their time. You don't want to be in your time somewhere else. You're going to be jet lagged and tired. So get out in the sun, that's always a good thing, drinking lots of water, but then just like living as though you're in their uh, day and time. So we get there, we should probably be sleeping, but it's lunchtime, so my buddy and I, we decided we're going to take a walk and find some little cafe to eat. It was an outdoor cafe where we could eat some wonderful pierogies, and right across the way from us, there was this beautiful historic medieval church, and if I'm not mistaken, it was the feast day of St. Corpus Christi. Inside the church, there was the remains of a saint buried there. I don't know who. We went over to see what all the hubbub was about because one thing was for certain, there was a lot going on inside. The front doors of the church were wide open and we could peer in. We couldn't go in because it was just filled with people, standing room only as they celebrated this great festival. And then people began to pour out from the church and into the streets and the courtyards around the facility. My friend and I, we just stepped back and uh, just watch from afar as a wonderful religious festival took place. It was compelling to us, and it, it drew us right along. One priest had a bullhorn and a microphone, and he was chanting prayers, and the people were singing prayers back, and they were all throwing um, uh, flower rose petals on the streets, and they walked as thousands of people walked together in parade. Another priest was swinging a censer, that's the technical term for that liturgical incense burner, and they would swing it, and puffs of smoke would come out, delighting the nose. So compelling to us. We didn't know what they were singing and saying in Polish, but we knew it was joyous, and so we followed for miles as this great festivity took place. Festivals are compelling. Every year at my former congregation, I was happy to put on a large harvest festival. In the center of a large field, we had a 30-foot-tall bonfire, and in the parking lot, we'd have 15 fire pits, and you'd, that's a lot of fire, but, you know, I'm a pyro. So we'd sit around these fires and roast marshmallows and listen to live music and uh, participate in a chili cook-off. There's the hay rack ride, all that stuff. One year, I had one of our starting point style classes where you're sitting with a group of visitors, regular visitors, and you're telling them about the church and asking them if they're interested in joining. And, and the first thing we do when we go around the table is we say, how have you come to know about us? And four or five people at this class said, oh, well, I'm in the neighborhood and I saw all your fires from your festival. And I thought, well, we had to check you out. Festivals are compelling, especially when at the heart of the festivity, is God. All genuine festivity comes from an appreciation, gratitude really, of being given something we don't really need or deserve. It's just an excess of gift, and we say thank you. That's at the heart of festivity, and that's at the heart of most Jewish festivals. Jewish festivals are these great times where the people gather together to remind one another of who they are and whose they are to remind the community together, remember what God has done for us. Remember that we are God's. We are God's chosen special treasure. And so they get together around great meals and great storytelling sessions, and it's fun, and it's compelling. Some Greeks standing by, they probably witnessed a number of these festivals of the Jewish people, and they were probably enamored for some time they were compelled to go to this festival. And they show up and they, they run into one of the disciples and they say, hey, you know, there's that teacher that you know, Jesus. And we'd like to talk to him. Something compelling always about Jesus, his teaching, his miracles, his reputation. There was something that, that men were, and women were drawn to, something different. And so the disciples, they go uh, to find Jesus. And this is where the story gets really weird because it's like there's a festival, it's a ritual, it's, it's a celebration, it's a party. And Jesus is somewhere off, just over there somewhere. I can almost imagine him being in a room by himself acting like Matthew McConaughey from those Lincoln commercials, saying things that no one understands as he looks out the window, rolling his fingers like this. 
the disciples, Andrew and Philip, they come and find Jesus and say, Jesus, um, uh, out here at the festival, where you should be, by the way, out here at the festival, some Greek fellows, they come, they wanted to talk to you. And Jesus is like, I don't know why I drive Lincolns. Just feels good. No, what he said was still something just as crazy to the disciples. He's like, you ever seen an acorn fall, uh, fall from a tree? Sometimes they die, sometimes they live. And he go on, goes on talking about living and dying and seeds and stuff. And you can imagine Philip and Andrew going, what's this guy talking about? We're just, Jesus, listen, man, there's some fellows that want to see you. Doesn't quite make sense, all this living and dying and reproduction talk until verse 32. And Jesus says then that he will be lifted up. And when he's lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. The gospel tells us that Jesus says those words in order to show us what kind of death that he would undergo. But earlier in the text, we find out also that this is the place where Jesus is glorified. So here's what Jesus is saying. It makes sense that some Greek fellows want to come see me because there's going to be a time soon when I am lifted up. And then, when I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all kinds of people to me. I like the way David Bentley Hart translates it. He says, I'm going to drag men to myself. It's interesting. It's interesting because nothing about the cross would speak to glory to anybody who knew anything about it. It wasn't just an undignified death. It was a traitor's death. It was a slave's death. And it was certainly lacking in glory. It was a symbol of great defeat. That's not glory. Yet, to hear the gospel spoken is to hear that God loved you in this way, that he would self-give. That's compelling. I was talking to Reverend Chambers about this yesterday, and, and he was talking about how it's not, Jesus isn't being attractive here. It's not about attraction, but it's about being compelled. It's a difference, because there's nothing beautiful about looking at this cross, but it's compelling because it's a symbol of somebody who gave their life for others. And the other strange thing that we reflect on again is this notion of that's glory somehow. I like what the 19th century Danish philosopher Kierkegaard said about it. He said, basically, the cross is a scandal to the mind. And you only have one or two responses when you are compelled to look at Christ on the cross. You have one or two responses to it. You look up and you either A, become offended. Because how can you point to that and say, that's God? So you become offended and you walk away. Or B, you accept it in faith. Jesus is telling these disciples, it's not strange that some Greek fellows would want to come and party with us because there's going to be a time when I'm lifted up and I will compel people to come. Now Jesus never says here that his glory is going to be obvious to people or that by compelling people to come and look that all people will accept in faith and believe but be compelled to come to the foot, all people will indeed. For it is a remarkable thing to point to the cross and say, there's my God. This is what God would do for us. It's a remarkable story. But here's my question. The church is often called the body of Christ, and I, and I wonder how seriously we take that phrase. What does it mean to be the body of Christ? The physical organ of God's grace doing God's work in the world. Well, I think it means we ought to look like Jesus. I think it means that the shape of our lives is a shape called cruciform, cross-shaped. But my real question is, if Christ draws people, drags people, compels people to come and feast their eyes upon his glory, how come people can't get away from us faster. People are leaving the church in droves. People don't want to go to church. 
you can look on any day in the newspaper and find the reasons why people are going and leaving church. But if we're the body of Christ, why aren't we compelling people? Now, going back to Reverend Chambers' point, we might get confused and say we need to become more attractive, and we might need to have some fancy mission statement and a glossy website, and that's all we have to do. But it's not about being attractive. It's about being compelling to people. Why are we not compelling people as the church in this world? Is it because instead of being a cruciform community that is founded on forgiveness and love, we've become a place of judgment? Is it because people come in the doors and they feel bad for being, thinking the way they think, being who they are, struggling with what they struggle with? Is it because we say we have an open table, but when people try to, to come sit at it, there's no spot for them. It's squeezed too tightly for them to take a seat. Maybe we're not compelling in the world anymore because people have come to the church with sincere doubt and struggle, and they found that they can't doubt and struggle with people. It's mostly, for them, an ideological tool I've got to repeat and say three things that you repeat and say, and if we agree, we're cool, but never really can I share with you my struggle. I can't be real with you and say, I'm really struggling with believing this right now. I'm really struggling with this particular temptation right now. Walk with me. Maybe we're not compelling people because we're not community anymore. We're an institution. People want to connect. They don't like Robert's rules of order. They love, I love you, brother and sister. I don't know, these are just questions, thoughts for you. Because as the body of Christ, we have to go back to Christ's own life and hear from him once more, and that will give us our mission. Christ tells us, I will be glorified when I am lifted up, and I will draw people to myself. Remember once more, church, the shape that we're supposed to be is cruciform. Remember once more the reason why Christ compels people to come and take a look, because Christ served. Christ gave it his own life. Christ brought people with him. Christ made room at the table because Christ loved so deeply and profoundly. May you go forth and draw people by the shape of your life. May we draw people with the shape of our faith. God bless you.